Hello, everyone. My name is Hong Fei. I'm a program director at MIT Corporate Relations. On behalf of MIT Industry Liaison Program, I welcome you to today's webinar, Quantum Computing, Opportunities and Challenges. Since its founding in 1948, MIT Industry Liaison Program has served as gateway connecting worldwide leading companies to MIT research and the large MIT innovation ecosystem, including MIT connected startups. If you are interested in learning more about the program, please visit our website at ilp.mit.edu. Today, we are delighted to have Professor Will Oliver, Director of the Center for Quantum Engineering at MIT to be our faculty speaker. He will start webinar with the introduction to quantum computing, as well as an update on the latest research activities at MIT in this field. We will then invite speakers from US government, Google, Keysight Technologies, and Zapata Computing to share their perspectives on the latest development of quantum technologies and applications. In the last 45 minutes, all the speakers will join the panel discussion and will address the questions from the audience. You are encouraged to submit your questions or vote on questions at any time during the webinar, actually starting right now. So please use the Q&A button on your screen for submitting questions or voting on questions. Please only use chat to report technical issues to our webinar team. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our website at ilp.mit.edu. All right, let's just get into this very exciting world of quantum computing. We are over to you. Great, thank you very much, Hong, and uh, welcome everybody to um, this webinar. I'm really glad you could take time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Um, my talk today is a, on an introduction to quantum computation. Um, and before I get started, let me just thank Hong, uh, Michael, Kayla, and the ILP team uh, for hosting this today. Great. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get started with a video that's from our MIT XPRO online professional development course. It's, it runs about four minutes um, and it gives a very brief introduction to quantum computation and then I'll come back in um, right after that's done. certain types of problems, ones of tremendous importance to humankind, and problems that today are practically prohibitive or maybe even impossible to solve with current computers. We hear about pharmaceuticals and drug discovery, gaining a better understanding of new materials like high temperature superconductors and how they work, new methods for machine learning, artificial intelligence, optimization problems, financial services and technology. Quantum computers will even challenge and change the way we securely communicate. It certainly sounds like a fantastic and exciting future, which leads us to a few fundamental questions. What exactly is a quantum computer and what's it good for? More importantly, when will we have one? Quantum computers are not just smaller, faster versions of classical computers. They're fundamentally different. We're in the digital computer world of bid, which is one basic element of information. It's a zero or a one. In a quantum computer, you can have a quantum bit or a qubit that's in a superposition of zero and one. We can design it, we can actually control it, we're actually engineering and manipulating quantum mechanics. So when we'll have a quantum computer is a very interesting and nuanced question, and the answer will therefore be kind of finicky. We've been saying uh, quantum computers are 
about 10 years away setting down the decades. Depending on your definition, we already have quantum computers. They're just small. Maybe my life's a puzzle that I won't turn over. <laughs> this is not decades away or 100 years away. That quantum age has now come. Quantum computers aren't simply faster, smaller versions of the conventional computers we have today. Nor are they another incremental step in the evolution of Moore's law. Rather, quantum computers represent a new, fundamentally different computing paradigm, one that carries tremendous advantage for certain types of problems of importance. Quantum computing uh, could really transform industries where there are significant optimization problems. You've got a lot of discrete or binary decisions to make to figure out, do you do this first or that first? This is where we shine. Another way to understand the difference between classical and quantum computer is if you look at quantum systems or quantum simulation. The quantum processor is a suitable tool for modeling other quantum systems. Biomolecule systems, tons of systems that we use, material systems, work based on those quantum mechanical properties. You kind of need a quantum machine in order to simulate quantum effects. When we can manipulate individual molecules and understand what's going on in those molecules, how they bond, then we'll be able to have a really good handle on, on generating new things, novel materials that might be very useful. Still, we're just at the very beginning of quantum computing development, assembling and testing the first prototype processors. It's a bit like being in the 1950s at the dawn of transistor-based computing. And just as integrated circuits led to an information processing revolution last century, driving economic growth and productivity, Many people today believe that quantum computing will have a similar impact this century. Quantum computing and quantum algorithms present fundamentally new programming and algorithm design paradigms. How do we fundamentally unlock new ideas in computing? We're still learning a lot about how to improve the individual components as well as connect them together. That's part of fun. That's where I'm there to see what can we do to enable that increased complexity and functionality of these qubits. We're really here at the very beginning, and it's, I just find that tremendously exciting. So it is a very exciting time for, for quantum information science and technology. And although today's talk is primarily about quantum computing, let me just take a step back for a moment and, and say that quantum technologies comprise uh, the sensing of quantum information, uh, its distribution over quantum networks, and then of course the processing of that information with quantum computers. And if we had to define it um, succinctly, I would say that quantum information science utilizes a quantum mechanical description of nature to sense, communicate, and compute information in ways that are unobtainable by a classical um, description of nature itself. And so again, the talk today will be primar primarily about quantum computation, but let me just highlight a few areas in quantum sensing and quantum communication that the Center for Quantum Engineering is also covering. And, and this includes uh, precise precision, um, pr pr precision positioning, navigation and timing, uh, remote sensing and detecting, biomedical applications, uh, for example, magnetic field sensing in the brain, um, next generation GPS, centimeter scale accuracy, and the distribution of quantum entanglement and secure communication. Um, and I just mentioned here that uh, MIT is very fortunate to have a uh, quantum communication test bed with fiber that runs from MIT Lincoln Laboratory uh, 42 kilometers down to the MIT campus where we can test these different quantum co uh, communication protocols. And so with that, we'll get into quantum computing. And before we get started, I'd like to start with a poll question, um, which you should see up here in front of you. And the question basically is, when do you think quantum computers um, will be commercially um, available, useful, viable? And that, that can mean different things to different people. But what do you think? Um, it, will it be in three years? Um, will it be within five years, uh, 10 years, uh, 20 years or more? Uh, who knows? I'm unsure. When do you think quantum computers are going to be uh, commercially useful?
It's a tricky question, right? Because even as Donna Rosenberg said in the video that we just saw um, that we actually have quantum processors today. And as we'll see, and, and as we'll talk about in the panel discussion, there are small scale quantum processors available to us now. But the question is, when will they become commercially viable? And of course they generate revenue already, but, but, but when will they generate profit? Okay, and so it looks like the poll results are in um, and we'll share these with everybody um, at the end. So I'm asked this question quite often and the way that I typically will address it is by, you know, I, I can't see the future any more than anyone else. And so what I do is I take a look back at the history of classical electronic computing. And here's a timeline that I'm showing here. Um, the vacuum tube was invented in 1906, and it was used for radio transceivers for a number of years. Um, but it was a full 40 years before we had our first um, vacuum tube-based computer called the ENIAC, and that was in 1946 at the University of Pennsylvania. Around this time, the transistor was invented uh, in 1947 at Bell Labs. Um, and although within about 10 years, uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory had built the first fully transistor-based computer called TIXO based on these transistors, it's very different than what we know of today. I mean, these transistors were soldered together, um, used a magnetic core memory, et cetera. Now around that time, the first integrated circuits were developed at uh, Texas Instruments. And it was yet another 15-ish, 20 years or so before we had uh, the first chips that we would recognize today, built by Intel, for example, the, the 4004 with 2000 transistors in the early 70s. It would take another 25 years to get to the Pentium Pro with millions of transistors, and then another 20 years to get to where we are today um, with multi-core processors uh, and GPUs with, with billions and billions of transistors. So if we look back at this timeline, it's well over 100 years of development to get from the first uh, elemental logic elements to where we are today. Now we can compare that or contrast it with quantum computing, which is still at its very beginning, it's, it's nascent. Um, in the early 80s, Richard Feynman proposed that if you want to simulate a quantum system, you had better use a quantum system to do it because it's a hard problem. There are many, many degrees of freedom. And, you know, theorists thought about this for, again, a good 10 or 15 years before we started to see the first quantum algorithms, theoretically speaking, the first quantum algorithms like Shor's factorization algorithm, uh, Grover's algorithm for search, uh, quantum annealing and adiabatic quantum computing. Um, and from that point forward, um, it was a good, you know, 10 or 15 years to get to where we are today, where we have the first few qubit processors, um, you know, in the cloud with five, uh, 16, 20 qubits. And then just last year, uh, the Google team demonstrated quantum advantage with a 53 qubit quantum processor. So what's the takeaway message? Well, the first thing that I take away from this is that quantum computing is real and it's transitioning from scientific laboratory curiosity to technical reality. That's happening right now. I also take away that what well, we all know that, you know, advancing from a fundamental discovery uh, in a laboratory to a useful machine takes time and it takes engineering. And of course, you must be in the game to play. Um, it may not be surprising that many of the leading technology companies today uh, who are manufacturing hardware uh, were in this from the very beginning or they um, bought companies that were in it from the very beginning. And of course, we use these quantum computers to run algorithms. And I list here many of the algorithms that we know of today, or at least the categories. I'm, I'm not gonna read this whole chart, but let me just illustrate or articulate the columns. We have the classical time that it would take a classical computer. We have the quantum time, which it would take on a, a quantum computer at scale and then the speed up and limitations related to research today. Now, um, if you look at these algorithms, the one thing that stands out to me is that many of them were either developed or advanced by MIT faculty. For example, uh, of course, Shor's factoring algorithm, um, which is used for cryptanalysis, uh, and in particular, the RSA uh, crypto, crypto scheme, uh, was developed by Peter Shor. Um, quantum simulation, which many believe is going to be the killer app for quantum computers, whether to develop new chemistry or new materials, um, again, uh, has a big influence from researchers at MIT, uh, Troy Voris um, and Seth Lloyd. Uh, linear systems of equations, of course, are very important. Um, sampling solutions to very, very large matrices. 
um, Aram Harrow and Seth Lloyd, uh, optimization problems, and then of course search problems. So all of these are very important problems. I mean, if you think about optimization, uh, optimization is ubiquitous and everybody's trying to optimize, uh, optimize something, whether it's a financial portfolio um, or a technical challenge like trying to orient the satellites in space with multiple users and multiple vantage points, um, optimization is ubiquitous. So there's a lot of promise to quantum computing. That's fantastic. So uh, what's the problem? Why don't we have one today? And it comes down to two characteristic times that I'd like to introduce. One is the coherence time and the other is the gate time. So the coherence time, you can think of this as the quantum bit, the fundamental logic elements, quantum mechanical lifetime, how long its quantumness remains viable. And if we have a qubit, we can put it in a quantum state, which we represent with this capital Psi letter. And at time t equals zero, we know exactly what it is. But this qubit is always interacting with its environment. And over time, this state decays and eventually blurs and is completely lost. Now, the qubit didn't disappear. The qubit is still there. But the problem is the state that it's in after some time period is unknown to me as the algorithm designer. Um, and this lifetime due to inter environmental disruption is called the coherence time. Now, the second time scale we care about is the gate time. And this is the time required to perform um, a logic operation. So quantum computers, just like classical computers, use logic gates to implement quantum logic. Um, these are single qubit gates and two qubit gates. And with single and two qubit gates, a handful of them, one can implement any quantum logic. Just like in a classical computer, if you have uh, one bit and two bit gates, a few of them, you can implement any Boolean logic. So the time to implement one of these gates on a quantum computer is called the gate time. And as you might imagine, then there's a figure of merit, which is basically how many gates can I perform within the coherence time that I have? And, and this figure of merit um, is important because it emphasizes something um, that, that is a bit nuanced, but, but is certainly true, is that it's not enough for a qubit to have a very long coherence time. It's, it's what's really important is how many gates can I perform within the coherence time that I have. And so with this, what we can do is we can look at many of the qubit technologies or modalities that are being investigated today. And we can plot this in the following way. We have this figure of merit on this axis, which is the number of gates or operations I can perform within the coherence time before there's an error. And on this axis is the gate speed how fast the gates are. And um, just like with classical computers, faster is better. Now on this axis here is gate fidelity and we see that the gate fidelity is just one to one in the number of operations before an error. So if I have a hundred operations before an error, that's 99% fidelity. A thousand operations before an error, that's 99.9% .9 fidelity, et cetera. That's how that's defined. And that we have a red line here, and I just mentioned this, that if you've heard of something called quantum error correction, which is a way to add redundancy to improve the overall performance of the system, uh, that's great. But when you do that, the individual elements need to be at least so good beyond some threshold, such that when you add more and more together, things actually get better rather than things getting worse. And, and this threshold is roughly at the 99% level for the most lenient error correcting codes that we know. And of course, best performance then is in the upper right corner. So with that setup, we can now look at different technologies. There are a number of qubits, which uh, technologies that have demonstrated single qubit gates. And I just list them here. Um, for example, phosphorus doping in silicon or the silicon MOS dot. And these technologies are just recently demonstrating two qubit gates. The remainder here though, have demonstrated the universal set of gates needed for quantum logic. And these are single and two qubit gates. And you can see a number of technologies which I'll highlight uh, in the coming slides. So one of the two most um, advanced technologies today is trapped ions. And um, here are some researchers, uh, Ike Chuang and Rajiv Ram at MIT campus, as well as John Chavarini and Jeremy Sage at MIT Lincoln Lab investigating trapped ions. And the other is superconducting qubits, uh, which is my own research area, along with Kevin O'Brien, Terry Orlando, and Jamie Kerman at Lincoln Lab. And if, if I had to say, you know, very succinctly, what are we researching? Trapped ions are trying to make their gates faster 
okay? And they're also trying to improve the two qubit fidelity. And superconducting qubits, they're already fast enough, and they're basically trying to make higher fidelity gates. Now, speed still matters, right? And, and you can think of it this way, is that if a quantum algorithm is exponentially faster than a classical algorithm, that's fantastic. You know, it no longer takes me 10,000 years to run a task. It takes me much less time. But still, there's a difference between slow and fast in the following sense, which is that if it takes me a day on my superconducting qubit quantum computer, which is running at maybe 100 megahertz, um, a thousand times faster than a trapped ion quantum computer, all else being equal, that's a very important caveat, um, that a day on a superconducting quantum computer would be a thousand days on a trapped ion quantum computer. And so the gate speed still matters, and that's why trapped ions are trying to increase the speed with which they can perform their logic. We're also investigating other technologies uh, at MIT and Lincoln Laboratory. So uh, one is neutral atoms, and here are uh, Vlad, Vlad and Vuletic, Wolfgang Ketterle, and Martin Zweierlein uh, working on this area. Also NV centers by Dirk England and Paula Capolaro and um, Daniel Bragi at Lincoln Lab. And um, my own group is starting uh, silicon quantum dots research as well. Um, so there are many candidate technologies under development to realize the promise of quantum computing. And although I've cast these in the context of quantum computing, many of these technologies are also used as quantum sensors or as a means to um, facilitate communication of quantum communication. So there's a lot of promise uh, for quantum computing. And as a result, there's tremendous investment going on worldwide. And we'll talk more about this uh, certainly in the panel session. But what you can see here is a number of efforts, I won't read through them all, um, being funded worldwide in quantum computing um, by nations, by states. But what's really changed in the last several years is that um, companies have realized the value and potential value of quantum computing uh, to their bottom line. And in fact, many entrepreneurial startup companies are realizing that there are services that they can generate and, and, um, and sell. And so it's in this context that we formed last year the Center for Quantum Engineering as an initiative between uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory and the Research Laboratory of Electronics uh, at MIT. That was, that was the uh, instantiation of it, um, but it is institute-wide. And so let me just talk briefly about the center. Um, you can find uh, the center website shown here at this URL. Our mission statement is to the academic pursuit and practice of quantum engineering to accelerate the practical applications of quantum technologies. And I wanna emphasize that quantum means science and engineering of course means engineering. And so quantum engineering is both science and engineering. The science is not over, but we need to start engineering systems of quantum uh, qubits. The objectives here are many fold, but let me just mention four of them. Uh, the first is to define quantum engineering. What is it? And what are the textbooks? We have to write them. What does the curriculum look like? We have to develop it. Um, and we use it to educate tomorrow's quantum engineers and create a quantum workforce for this growing field. And to do that, we want to partner with industry via consortium model, which I'll talk about in a moment. And our, our general goals are to advance quantum science and engineering. And so we, we have a large membership. This is a partial list. I couldn't fit everybody uh, on one slide. But as I mentioned, it comprises membership from uh, the MIT campus, many departments across the Institute. Um, you'll see physics, electrical engineering, material science, um, chemistry, uh, chemical engineering, mathematics, et cetera, um, as well as uh, membership from Lincoln Laboratory. And we have a number of engagements that we've initiated over the past year. It's continuing to grow. Uh, one of the major ones um, was where that video came from at the beginning. That's the MIT XPRO Professional Development Series of Courses. Um, it was underwritten and sponsored by IBM. Um, and there are two classes, uh, or four courses actually. The Fundamentals of Quantum Computing has two classes. And then the Practical Realities of Quantum Computing has another two classes. And you can learn more about the professional development courses uh, here at this URL. Um, Ike Chuang and myself were the faculty leads and we taught it, um, teach it with Peter Shore and Aram Harrow. Uh, we've had more than 2000 learners take it uh, in the last 18 months and we're now offering it multiple times per year. And it, the focus is on people who are already in industry and want to pivot towards quantum uh, technologies. 
Uh, the second engagement is with the Laboratory for Physical Sciences, um, and this enabled us to form the Center for Quantum Engineering, uh, the CQE LPS Doc Bedard Fellowship Program. Uh, Doc Bedard was an NSA uh, LPS uh, scientist for many, many years, really spearheaded uh, the use of cryogenic electronics uh, for classical computation. And through this program, um, we have now eight three-year fellowships, uh, graduate fellowships, um, a few sponsored research programs that we um, administer through the CQE, and um, funds to develop uh, quantum curricula. We also facilitate faculty industry engagement. I just give one example here, which I think um, Liz, one of the panelists will talk about as well. Um, and that is um, through a very generous donation from Keysight Technologies, we are developing a 64 qubit testbed system uh, at MIT. Um, and Keysight Technologies in particular is interested in seeing their electronics being used in state-of-the-art uh, experiments. And of course, another industrial engagement is in fact the Quantum Science and Engineering Consortium Industrial Group. So that group of course is a membership program um, and as a member, the entry fee is 150K per year. Um, and startups, uh, we want to include them as well um, in this ecosystem. Um, so we charge them only 10K per year because you know, money is quite valuable to a startup, but time is also valuable to them. And so we charge them time, they have to show up. Um, there, I won't get into all the details. There are options if you're an existing um, MIG member or MIT.nano member, there are options of uh, how to join um, at a reduced cost. But what's important is the value proposition for doing this. Um, one is access to faculty and research at MIT. Another is engagement with the fantastic students and postdocs that we have, which then leads downstream to recruitment opportunities. We host a number of special events, workshops throughout the year, as well as the ability to network with other members uh, in the consortium. We provide discounts to these professional development programs. Um, and um, perhaps most popular, I guess we'll see, is that the ability to customize membership fee dues. So of that 150K that um, you, you might spend as a due, um, 100K you can customize. You can send that to a faculty member, um, a laboratory, you get to choose how that 100K is spent within the auspices of quantum science and engineering. Another 25K we hold and use for faculty startups or infrastructure, and then 25K is used for the operations costs of the center. And what that means is that 83% of your fees are going directly to supporting research activities at MIT. And I'll, I'll highlight that these funds are in fact a gift, which makes them discretionary. And at MIT, that means they don't incur overhead. And so these funds go even further um, than say a sponsored research agreement. So that leads me to the second poll question, um, which I would like your input on. Um, and that's basically with the Center for Quantum, uh, Quantum Science and Engineering Consortium, the benefits or value proposition that I just spoke about which of them would you or your company uh, find most valuable or attractive? And in this one, you can select all that apply. Um, and again, you know, the options are access to faculty and research. You know, this means that you can call up a faculty member. Um, if you've customized your dues to this person, um, they're very likely to pick up the phone and, and have a conversation, right? Um, talk about your interest in quantum. Um, you also get early access to the research that's going on. Of course, there's also engagements with students and that leads to recruiting downstream. Uh, MIT students, as you know, are just simply fantastic. Um, special events and workshops, the ability to network, um, in addition to companies and startups that will be attending um, our, these workshops and annual events, we, we, we also will invent, uh, inv invite members of the um, US government who are sponsoring uh, research uh, in this area. Uh, discounts on professional development programs, as I've mentioned, and also there's opportunities if you're in multiple consortia that we can uh, provide discounts there. And then again, the customization of the membership fee, that 83% is gonna go directly to, um, to research here at MIT. So I'd like to hear um, from your perspectives, which of these are the most valuable uh, or the most attractive? Um, okay, and that, that has come in and, and it's, Looks like access to faculty and research, uh, as well as the special events um, and students are high. Good, thank you for that. Okay. 
Okay, so now moving on. So I want to emphasize that MIT, the Institute is not just MIT campus. I've mentioned Lincoln Lab a couple times and I want to emphasize here that Lincoln Lab is MIT's national laboratory. Uh, it's a Department of Defense national lab. It's, it's a fantastic place. It's where I started my career. And uh, Lincoln Lab has well over 100 people who are working on quantum information science and technology uh, from sensors to quantum communication to um, uh, quantum computing as well. And there's many ways in which we uh, interact. And part of the center's mission is to make this interaction uh, easier and facilitate it. And I just bring up one example here. Um, in terms of fabrication, um, M uh, Lincoln Laboratory has a fantastic fab facility. It's a DOD trusted foundry, ISO 9001 certified. And this is a place where we can do high yield, reproducible um, fabrication processes at a larger scale, building test beds. This fabrication line is a 200 millimeter fabrication line. And as you know, just recently, MIT invested more than $400 million in what's called MIT.nano, which is a companion facility at the MIT campus. And, and this is really fantastic for quantum information because this facility is more than two times larger than any other US academic facility. Um, and this is where we can do novel rapid prototyping, exploratory research on smaller wafers. And we, we will have in fact 200 millimeter wafer tools. We're installing some this year. And so the interaction between Nano and Lincoln Laboratories Mel um, is going to be very strong and complementary. And, and this is just one example of where we can impact materials research, um, fabrication engineering, and, and the like. So with that, let me conclude and just say what I think quantum engineering is. And, and really it's an institute-wide effort. If we want to build future quantum systems, we first need to build test beds. And to do that, we need to bridge the science and mathematics side of MIT, the School of Science, Physics, Math, Computer Science, with the classical engineering, uh, the school of engineering, such as analog and digital circuits, control, DSP, materials and fab. And both of these sides need to pivot to quantum. And so I view quantum engineering as the bridge, which is connecting science, math, and classical engineering. Um, let me just briefly mention that we've selected a number of panelists today um, to, to, to partake in our discussion. And I really appreciate their, their um, attending today, both from government and from industry. So Dr. Charlie Tahan, uh, Dr. Eric Lucero, um, Ms. Liz Ruch, and Dr. Christopher Savoy. And I'll, I'll introduce them one by one as they, um, as they come on. But I want to mention that Charlie's with um, the U.S. government, OSTP, in the National Quantum Coordination Office. Um, Eric is with Google and represents a maker of uh, quantum computing systems. Liz is with Keysight Technologies, making the electronics which will go around quantum sensors or quantum computers. And um, Christopher is with Zapata, which is building um, the algorithm, developing the algorithms that we're going to use and is representing the startup community. So with that, let me summarize, you know, quantum sensing, quantum communication and quantum computing is transitioning to reality. That's happening today. And as a result, we've instantiated the Center for Quantum Engineering. It's enabling this transition. Um, research, education, workforce development, outreach, and more, but also um, engagement with industry. And that led us to the industrial consortium, the QSEC. Um, and MITx Pro um, was our first online set of courses for professional development, but we're now expanding both to curricula at MIT. Um, and we're also sponsoring uh, recently the coding school, which was had more than 300 um, high schoolers for a week long course. Um, uh, in fact, taught by two of my graduate students. Um, and for more information um, at any time, please feel free to contact me um, at this email right here. And so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen.